We're here to idea everyone, to fire up your curiosity and connect you with the people and ideas that shape our world. Watch, listen, understand, connect, create. Let's move the human story forward together. Our environment is threatened by ever-increasing levels of pollution. One key step that might help us reduce carbon emissions would be to measure them. Tanso is a Munich-based startup that aims to do just that by offering software that helps industrial companies to measure, manage and cut their carbon footprint. Giri Ryerson is a co-founder of Tanso and I met her at this year's symposium organised by the students of St Gallen University in Switzerland. I'm Neil Koenig and I began this interview for Idea Me by asking Giri Ryerson to tell us more about herself and her company. I'm uh, Giri Ryerson. I am, am a nerd. I'm a climate activist. I'm a Norwegian. I'm an AI engineer and a founder of a climate tech startup. And what's the startup? The startup is called Tanso Technologies. Uh, it's a software company uh, based in Munich that is decarbonizing the industry and making sure that every industrial manufacturer can manage their carbon in an effective way and also be competitive uh, against other competitors just through their carbon management. How did you come up with the name Tanso? <laughs> and the name Tanso comes from uh, Japanese, it means carbon. And um, we had in the beginning um, a lot of discussions around what, what should be our identity. Um, and since one of my co-founders spent quite some time in Japan, we, spent, we then decided to call it Tanso and say, you know, carbon is, is the most important factor for, for reducing our emissions at the moment um, and therefore should be at the, the heart of our name as well. How did the idea uh, come about? So we, um, or the idea came from uh, my studies. So I studied um, AI and machine learning and did research at ETH researching how to use machine learning in order to quantify how much carbon is stored in forests. Um, and this type of carbon is often certified and therefore spent for um, or used as carbon offsets. And when you see the carbon offsetting market, it's growing, there's more and more interest for carbon, but that doesn't solve the issue in the first place. The issue is that we're emitting too much carbon and currently even um, forests, we're cutting more forests, so emitting more carbon through forests than um, sequestering carbon. Um, and that led to me and, and um, some friends of mine to do interviews with industrial players, the companies and the uh, stakeholders that are emitting the most carbon to figure out why are they not reducing? What are really the core, the root issue of carbon emissions? And if you look at Europe, 32% of emissions come from the industry. It comes from production. And through our interviews, we realized that the problem is not necessarily a willingness to reduce. There is a will there, and there's even a business case for it, but there's no transparency. And that led us to develop the software that easily helps track and manage actively your carbon emissions. So first getting an overview, where do they even come from? and then analyzing the hotspots, what is the most effective way to reduce your emissions fast, the low hanging fruits, and then going beyond that into how do you even change your core business? What will be different products to develop? What are recycling rates you can incorporate? What are different processing steps that you can take and um, changing fossil fuel based processes to, for example, um, more electrified uh, processes or maybe even hydrogen and nitrogen in the long run. So that's how it came about, um, and now we're um, a VC-backed startup and growing towards 30 people at the end of the year. You say you're helping companies to measure carbon. Um, how, how do you actually do that? Are you attaching probes to chimneys? It's quite interesting because um, how to manage and how to, how to calculate emissions um, is less real life than what you would believe. It's a lot of assumptions. 
Um, it's similar to financial accounting, where you say there's the pluses and minuses coming in and out of your, of your uh, business, um, and those are de determined by your customers or determined by your suppliers. If the price of something you pay or the, the price that you set for your customers. Um, when it comes to emissions, they're real. There are CO2 molecules flying around in the world and it being emitted, but they're not being measured in the same way as, um, as you would think. It's not a physical measurement of CO2 emissions. Um, it, it can be, and what currently is the status quo of carbon accounting or the, the state of the art carbon accounting is to make sure that you make assumptions based on processing steps. So you calculate um, based on one-offs. So you take a one product and say one process, let's try this out, measure it with actual hardware and measure how much CO2 comes out of it. Then you do that for a couple of products, similar processing steps, and then you make an industrial average out of it. And often those industrial averages are a good estimate for how much emissions are there, for example, in one kilogram of steel being produced in Europe compared to a kilogram of steel produced in China. And then you take these industrial averages and you use those as um, factors, so emission factors, and then you calculate your emissions based on the emission factor together with the actual consumption. So you buy 1,000 tons of steel and you multiply with the per ton emissions associated with that steel. On the long run, what we see is that more and more companies will actually measure how much in their production steps or in their supplier step in the entire life cycle of a product and um, will actually measure it and you will have real data and primary data if you want and not assumption based and that only will come in the future when we have good enough transparency throughout the entire supply chain and um, so every everything from mining the steel to melting it to producing it every single step need to be documented and currently we're working with industrial averages for that to at least create a infrastructure for sharing the data through the supply chain. So just to be um, clear about this, the, when, when you're coming up with this model the, for the industrial average, this process does actually start with putting a probe on a chimney or measuring a production line. Is that right? Yeah. So that's that. It's all scientifically based. So every um, calculation that we do are based on a database of emission factors or industrial averages that come from scientific peer-reviewed papers. So these are scientists that actually sit there with their measuring tools, um, measuring every process, measuring every, every step of a production, and then calculates an average based on that. And that is what we use in our calculations. But it presumably would be better if you could have little sensors or probes attached to every part of the process, or, or wouldn't it? I, I have to say I'm, I'm quite a, a pragmatic person. The question is what increase in accuracy would you get? Um, and currently there's the, the level of uncertainty in carbon calculations are quite high because there are these industrial averages still have um, a variety in their data, in the original data, and you have to kind of narrow that the confidence interval down into how uh, accurate is it. And currently that accuracy is far beyond how, like, is it one or two molecules um, additionally per, per measurement? I think in, in, um, in, the real, in, the, in the far future, there is a question of do we even, uh, would we need measurements? Because some of these, these um, measurements are also factored in with the global warming potential. So having CO2 has a different warming potential than methane, for example. And that is also an equation you kind of have to put together. What is the effect of these molecules? Not only what is the um, presence of them or the emissions of them. You have to say that to calculate that in as, as far as um, is it needed? I don't know. I think for the next 10 to 20 years, um, carbon will be more and more directly measured. But whether that is what is um, the best way to get to a level where, where you can still get to zero um, w with the lowest cost possible, I'm not sure. So you've got these industrial averages, you've got these yardsticks, these ways of arriving at some sort of measurement. Then what? What do, what do the companies do with this information? 
I think it it's always surprises me how little companies know um, or have a, a gut feel for their emissions. So, for example, we see a lot of companies reducing their reducing their um, flight usage. So they ask the CEO, please don't take so many flights. But if the amounts of flight emissions, like flights, you shouldn't take them anyways, but if the amount of flight emissions are just a 0.001% of your corporate carbon footprint, it's not even a drop in the ocean. Um, and that I think is the, the most interesting is first to just get the overview. What are the proportions of emissions? Where are the most emissions coming from? What are kind of low hanging fruits, like I said? Um, and most companies look at three levels. So you can either look at um, your own production, especially producing companies, they look at how much energy are we consuming? Are we wasting energy in our, um, are we putting the heating on over the weekend? We can turn it off, we can save costs while also saving emissions. Um, can we change over to green electricity? Should we invest in own solar panels uh, and also secure energy, which is a hot topic at the moment? Um, and that, or even maybe change their processes internally of um, using other, um, be be just becoming more effective um, and changing the energy source that they're using internally. Uh, the second point is going into your supply chain. So corporate carbon footprint um, is not only your own operations. You are also partially responsible, even though you cannot control it, you're responsible for your supply chain emissions as well. That means everything that your suppliers do, you're also responsible for. And everything that your customers do, you're also responsible for. That means that every product decision that you make, so if you uh, decide to buy steel from um, supplier one or supplier two, these emissions, you are this decision you can make, and therefore you're also responsible for counting in if one supplier is much worse in their processing of steel, for example, using a lot of fossil fuel, transporting it around the globe before it comes to you, you're responsible for that. Um, on the other hand, and the last point that I want to make is you can also change your own products. You see that a lot in energy consuming goods, most of the emissions come in the use phase of your product. So if you as a, a dishwasher um, or a washing machine producer, if you look into your products and say, actually you use 30% less energy when you wash with my machine, that is 30% less emissions in the use phase. And that is maybe 10, 20 years running weekly. That's a lot of emissions, even though the energy grid is now currently improving and becoming greener, there's a lot of emissions there in energy consumption. Um, when you think about it, fossil fuels is the main source of emissions. Yes, we have some burping cows, but most emissions comes from fossil fuels. It means that if you can either electrify or reduce the energy need in your supply chain, be it through your suppliers, choosing the ones that are using the electrified processes and electrified transport, same goes with your own operations and then also your own products and your core business. If you make your core business not dependent on fossil fuels, you have uh, a chance to reach net zero as a company. These approaches that you've been outlining, um, are, you, are you providing this kind of advice to companies as well as offering this service of helping them to get a handle on how much carbon they're producing? I think it's uh, similar to asking a software provider for accounting software if they can help you make your numbers less red. Uh, I don't say that I know the business better than the business owners themselves. I can show them the numbers and be clear on here's where emissions are, but I cannot run the business for them. I cannot necessarily make a decision that they should, uh, an oil company should stop with oil production and go over to wind. I cannot make that decision. I can um, make the business case for it through numbers. I can help them um, through software showcase, hey, suggestion. If you change this energy source to another one, you would reduce by 10%. Or uh, at one, customers we, uh, one customer we had um, had the, the, the discussion whether if they would change to 50% recycles, 
recyclables from their suppliers in aluminium, they would reduce their entire corporate carbon footprint by 30%. And that was just by the top five suppliers. And if we can encourage these conversations through data, that's the way to go and that's how we can do it. We're not offering any consulting because there's nothing um, nothing specifically we can do. We work very closely with industry associations um, who are creating initiatives and best practices and sharing platforms that we contribute and say this is what we have aggregated from, from many customers doing the similar things or doing the same. Um, but doing one-on-one uh, decision-making for companies is not something we see as our role. But on the other hand, um, given all the data you're processing, you might be you might be seeing um, you know patterns emerge, and maybe that's something that you know in the future you could start sharing with your customers. So I'm an AI engineer. Um, meaning I lo love everything that can be automated and done without manual input and without humans. Um, I think that you cannot go away from human ingenuity. Yes, you can copy paste from others. Yes, you can um, make best practices shared and you make smart suggestions. You can encourage people to spend less by incentivizing them um, through software, through technology. But at the same time, there's up to them of figuring out how does this break the cycle of our mental models internally. Um, and that is something we, like my goal would be that, um, my goal would be that no one has to think about emissions and that they're automatically reduced. But then you also take away the freedom of decisions from humans. It's the same as financial decisions or um, calorific decisions. I can decide that I now want to eat a chocolate. It's not good for me, it's not good for the healthcare system, it's not good for um, for any system around me. Um, maybe a little bit dopamine help uh, my mood. <laughs> but there's, I can make that decision as a free human, I can do that. And that's same for businesses. You can automate up to a certain point or make suggestions um, and encourage and incentivize and even set up uh, locks on the fridge type of uh, technical so solutions of preventing from making the worst choices. You can set up that in a technical and automated way. Um, but when it comes to ultimately humans have to make the decision and have to stand for them. Some years ago uh, I talked to Amory Lovins who is, was founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, a um, environmental think tank based in Colorado. And he used to talk about approaching big companies on the question of being more environmentally responsible in their activities. But his pitch to them was always, you're paying for the pollution that you're sending up the chimney and actually you can also do some good for the planet and save a lot of money at the same time. The kind of service you're offering might, you might be able to highlight the sort of financial benefits as well as the environmental ones. Yeah. So when it comes to putting a price on carbon or incorporating, or if you want, um, internalizing the externality that carbon is, um, that is definitely something that, that we do. What I um, what I sometimes find interesting is that we're, as a society, as businesses, we're so optimized for profit. We have one KPI that we're optimizing for, and we make it hard for ourselves to incorporate other factors. And we see this with ESGs, or Environment, Social and Governance, um, that they try to create a more complex equation with more factors in it that try to weigh the different benefits of the different factors. And where you see long-term versus short-term um, profits has an influence if you take the other in fact, factors into, in or not. Um, I, I think you more and more can make the business case for long-term um, reduction of carbon, but also other environmental factors, such as water consumption or even energy consumption. Um, there is a business case for it. Um, we see the same thing on the social side of, of um, of ESG, 
that in having more inclusion gives higher performing teams. You have better profit as a company if you have teams that perform better and are more uh, um, can think new and think new ideas and be more disruptive in their innovation. Um, it's a it's a no brainer. But at the same time, how do you balance that, especially when humans are um, biologically wired for um, reducing the importance of the future compared to the to the current state? Where they say, now I want chocolate. I don't care if I get fat by it. Um, like that's a problem for the future. And I think I, I occur, I'm a very technological optimist. I believe that we can use technology and use this like complex equations over the like it gets more and more complex the more factors you have in it, and use that both in terms of forecasting and creating a picture of do you want to be there and how can you motivate yourself or how can we play around with the human biology, um, to make the case it will be more profitable. Forecasting will be a great like if you install your PVs after five years, even including all the risks with it, you will have profit and. All the years after those five years, you save money. Great case. Uh, and that I think, I think there are so many business cases to be made, but it's more we need experience from it. And I think in the last 20, 30 years, we have started to build up uh, on the one side um, use cases or business cases for it. On the other side, the technology has developed crazily. Um, green energy is cheaper than fossil fuels in the most of the cases. Um, and I think there, the, the, there's still a work to be done to um, integrate that into companies and where we see that a lot of uh, companies face a lot of fear for change and pushback from own employees because they don't necessarily see the future. They don't see the current or future benefit of this change that uh, we want to have, and especially because it's going so fast. Um, there's, a, there's a saying uh, amongst the sustainability managers in companies that from the outside they're loved and from the inside they're hated. Um, because internally there's so much, um, there's already a lot of pressure of optimizing for profit. And everyone feel they, they have a another pressure point coming in instead of thinking the two or thinking carbon and profit together. Um, and that I think you can give tools through software, you can give tools to make that more simple and make it a no brainer. Um, whereas um, the current status quo is that you're in the dark and then only feeling the pressure coming in from both sides and then you resist um, making any changes because at least you won't be hurt if you're optimizing for profit. Like in the 1960s, the uh, IT manager would never get fired for buying IBM. Exactly. I think it's a similar one in the business world saying that you will never get fired for hiring McKinsey. <laughs> so the, the biggest challenges you face then are to do with human behavior, changing that. Yeah, humans have flaws, um, as any system, I guess. Um, the biggest challenge is definitely to work with people. We see that um, on global scales, collaboration is hard. Overcoming differences is hard. Understanding and having empathy for different opinions is super hard. Trusting someone you wouldn't trust is hard. Um, and that, I think, is is in general the biggest challenge that we're facing, especially facing the climate change. Because a lot of trust is based on familiarity and you need trust to bring up the courage to change. And currently we need change that is not only on a, on a linear time scale, we need it at an exponential. And that means that every single second you have to double your change. And when you're afraid of change, you push back and you stop it. So you don't even change regularly or, st or stably, you just stop and you want to prevent it. And with climate change, there will be a lot of migration. There's a lot of 
new people, new opinions, new perspectives coming in. And if we are not able to embrace that, and it's hard, and it's uncertain, and it requires us to be vulnerable, it requires us to have a lot of courage. If we can't overcome that and sit at the table, look each other in the eyes and say, how can we make this um, a good place to be for us and for future generations, that is a big challenge. Um, of course, you can sprinkle in that AI has a tendency of increasing differences. It has a tendency of uh, increasing biases or just blowing them out of proportions. We're currently seeing that inequalities in Europe um, and across, across the globe is, is increasing again. And how will that change and how will the political system also uh, change with more and more migration and people having to leave their homes um, to find another life? Um, I myself have moved a lot in my life. I have um, lived in many countries and had to adapt everywhere I come. And adaption isn't necessarily great for diversity. If I adapt and leave, leave my, old, my own perspectives, my own background, my, my experiences, and not bring them in, no one is better off. And it's uh, psychological and uh, an emotional and, and I, so your identity is also stirred with when you have to leave and especially forced to leave I was willingly leaving um, but if you're forced to leave your home and your country your familiarity your trust levels are very low and especially when you then come to another place and the other place don't trust you who are you your uh, unfamiliar face you have different opinions, you have different behaviors, you have different cultures, then that is not a, a good basis to start collaborating. And I think we cannot be unconscious of um, how the challenge of collaborating, the challenge of coming to the same table, how that challenge is going to be harder and harder. So what I normally say to to our customers and sustainability managers that are working internally is yes, you have a, a, a different set of people that you have to collaborate with currently, but let's face it, in the future it's just going to be worse, so let's practice on what we have and make the best out of it. Um, it's not going to get easier, but we can already figure out good solutions with the people we have. Now, if what you're offering is such a good idea, you must have competitors. Yeah, thank God. Um, <laughs> um, so first of all, I believe that a competition is a good thing, is a healthy thing. Um, we're all working on the same mission. And if someone is able to calculate carbon emissions for the entire industry before, before me or before um, us, great. So there's a race, is there? Hmm? There's a race, is there? Definitely. There's a race and an execution game currently of getting out there and um, capturing also the value that is generated through um, through calculating emissions and reducing emissions, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. We need so much reduction and we need, there's so many companies, there's over 50,000 companies in the EU alone, and not including uh, the UK here, that need to report emissions starting 2025. And we're not even close to covering all of them. And it's, it's a green field, it's a, it's a gold rush, if you want, when it comes to climate tech. But in the future, almost every company needs to be a climate tech company. There are, every company has to understand their risks, external risks, their infrastructure risks that they have, and how they play a role and can capture on this value. If that's a big company, if that's one of the big tech companies seeing their opportunities coming in, or if it's um, a small startup like mine, there is a market opening up when it comes to carbon emission reductions and um, I'm happy to take a part of it. And this market works, does it, the carbon emissions market, because some critics are sceptical about it. I think there's, there are different carbon markets. Um, so one is the, uh, the open carbon offsetting markets, so buying and selling carbon emissions if you want. Um, then on the other hand there is the um, associated market of, for example, energy and energy storage that doesn't have anything directly to do with carbon, 
but that is the solutions you would need in order to reduce your carbon. Um, and that is the market that is now opening up. People, uh, companies investing more and more into solutions on how to reduce their carbon. And that is also what I mean by the bigger market um, of how to reduce emissions is very little to do with carbon often uh, directly. It has everything to do with energy, it has everything to do with um, materials and recycling and circular economy. It's about changing business models. Um, and that market, if you can capture that value of um, transitioning to, to more electric, uh, electrified world, a greener uh, energy world, if you're part of that transition, you can take a piece of the guy. What would be your advice to young people who are thinking of working in the same field as you? We see a huge transition of people quitting their jobs and wanting to work in climate. Um, I think it's one of the, um, if not the, the biggest challenge of our generation. Um, I see myself in, in 2050, because we talk a lot about net zero until 2050. In 2050, I will be 55 years old. Um, hopefully have children, they're studying. Um, I have still a couple of good years to, do, to work until I'm retiring. But the consequences of climate will happen after 2050. So now in the next 20, 30 years will be the, the best climatic 20, 30 years we'll have in the future. And how I see it is that um, if you want to work in climate, you have to have a job and then you have to think how does that, how is that influenced by climate and how does that influence climate. Um, that means, for example, if you work as a train, uh, as a truck driver, you have to lobby internally for yourself. How can, um, how can my position be part of electrifying our fleet? How are we future proof for redu reducing our own emissions? Um, how are we um, affecting uh, the, the environment around us? Um, how are we socially doing? And I think that, that my one tip for people who want to work in climate is to make sure that you're working on a topic that you care about. So not only climate, climate will infuse everything we do, but work on a topic that you care about, if that's education, if that's health, if that's um, engineering, like we need everyone, we need the, uh, the craftsmen um, in everything we do. And then you think, how does that, how does that um, impact climate? And how can you be a part of changing your industry, your field? for the better and therefore be more climate proof. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us for this episode of the Idea Me Show. Idea Me is a global platform. Our mission is to move the human story forward by sharing knowledge of the future. You can find us on all major audio networks at www.radioideame.com, on YouTube and Vimeo. Please subscribe.